We've got a very exciting panel here, both because of its topic and because of its ex uh, extremely distinguished panelists. Um, and just by way of preface, I'll say that having worked in the religious freedom field on the policy and scholarship side for a while, it almost seems like we're, to borrow uh, maybe some of Sam Huntington's nomenclature, we're entering a, a second wave of religious freedom scholarship. So if the first wave could have been defined as just trying to understand what is this issue, what does religious freedom itself mean, um, how is it either honored or dishonored, how is it uh, respected or violated around the world, um, the second wave that we're entering is the religious freedom and question, religious freedom and political institutions, religious freedom and national security as per our earlier panel, and especially religious freedom and economic growth and prosperity and, and economic development. And so uh, it's you know, intellectually, I think we're at a very exciting moment uh, in, in this, at the beginning of this new second wave of scholarship. And uh, our panelists here are really some of the leading voices uh, from, from different perspectives on this. So. Um, but to, so to introduce them, uh, first we've got Milan alone here, um, who is uh, has a endowed chair almost as long, maybe even longer, as John Owens. He's the George D. and Harriet W. Cornell Chair of International Business and the director of the China Center at Rollins College. So, uh, and again, brings a very distinguished business background as well as um, expertise as a, as a sinologist. Of course, now the world's second largest economy, and if present trends continue, uh, potentially the world's largest economy soon. Soon enough. So, um, then next to him we have Timur Karan uh, from Duke University, a professor of economics and political science, and the Gorder family professor in Islam in Islamic studies, um, and uh, with a, a particular core expertise on Turkey, but also a much broader expertise on the Islamic world and uh, economic factors there. Then we've got Ian Linden, um, who has graciously hopped across the pond from London, where he's with the Tony Blair Faith Foundation. Um, I might add, during my time in London, my office was just around the corner from the Tony Blair Faith Foundation when you guys were just opened your doors. So it's great to see the, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, are you, you're still in um, the old John Adams residence, right? When he was the U U.S. Yeah, ambassador? We, we used to call it the, the first embassy. Yeah, we yeah, enjoyed very much being there. But we've moved out, actually, with the African <laughs> Governance Initiative to Marble Arch. So. Okay. All right, so. <laughs> leaving the rump there. <laughs> okay, all right, leaving the rump on Grosvenor Square. So um, anyway, uh, and uh, Ian, again, has a very distinguished background of both scholarship and, and policy work and, and activism, especially in, in human rights. He's uh, lived and worked all, all over the world and intersections between human rights and economic development. And then finally, we have Rebecca Shaw, um, a research fellow uh, right here at Georgetown at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and, and World Affairs. Um, and she's the project leader of a research initiative on religion, entrepreneurship, and economic development, and is a very um, impressive array of, of publications. So as per previous uh, panels, we'll follow the same format of each panelist will make some opening remarks, um, addressing these questions of the relationship, or, or perhaps lack thereof, between religious freedom uh, economic freedom and prosperity. Um, then we'll have a we'll, we'll have a we'll have a discussion. So first, Milan. Milan. Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the impact of religious freedom on economic prosperity. It occurred to me that the way we posed the question on economics was a little bit different than how we posed it on politics, where we said liberal democracy and sustainable over time. So I think, if I may, I'd like to qualify that what we're talking about is liberal economics that is sustained over a period of time. Um, and I, I came to this panel because I, uh, I wrote a, an article that was published in the Cato Journal in which I proved that there is an empirical connection between religious freedom and economic prosperity above and beyond economic freedom and political freedom. So religious freedom seemed to have an impact. Now the question of course is, well, why does it have an impact on, on economic prosperity? And I thought of three causal pathways that, that, may, uh, that may impact it. I think the first one has to do with institutions. It is true to say that religious freedom uh, correlates with civil freedom, political freedom, and economic freedom. It's not a perfect correlation, but there is a correlation. And religious freedom is part of an institutional environment. So clearly, uh, in those institutions, like liberal democracies that we talked about earlier, uh, that uh, espouse freedom, 
including economic and political freedom, they tend to also espouse uh, religious freedom. Now, when we talk about institutions, I think it's very important that we realize that uh, institutions have at least three dimensions. Uh, one is regulatory, one is normative, and the other one is cognitive. So it is not enough to think about religious freedom in terms of what the government regulates, but above and beyond that, what are people thinking? And what are, what are the norms? So I think one of the great things that make this country great is that religious freedom is also a normative value. And it's also a cognitive value. So if it's not only illegal to, cer to do certain things against other people's religion or infringe on their liberties, but it's also unacceptable to do so. And this is one of the reasons that makes uh, the institutional environment uh, quite good. Now having said that, I, I should also say that religious freedom, in my opinion, is a necessary ingredient for economic prosperity, but not a sufficient ingredient. That religious freedom has to be accompanied by other factors in order to have a, a good economic uh, prosperity. So one is the, the institutional environment. The second causeway, I think, is the fact that if we have religious freedom and we don't discriminate against people of certain religions, the society is more likely to make uh, more optimal decisions, economic decisions. Take, for example, the Soviet Union, where Jews were not allowed to go en masse to universities. There were quotas on how many Jews would be in universities, and therefore, uh, Jews that were qualified and smart could not attend schools despite their qualifications. So in this case, the society has, uh, was harmed, their economic development was harmed by putting people who are perhaps less qualified in university position that they should otherwise do. The third uh, way in which uh, economic prosperity is impacted is through trade and investment. One of the things that we know from economics is that trade happens with, uh, when institutional uh, similarities. So trade happens with those countries uh, with which we have institutional similarity, including uh, religious freedom, which is uh, a value we espouse and promote across the world. And in this, having said that, we would expect, and it, would be, it was proven by economists, that through gravity models, that those economies that have Similar cultures and similar institutions are more likely to get our investments and our trade. And given that investment and trade are critical to economic development, uh, I think this is another uh, pathway. In addition to that, um, country risk. It turns out that those countries that have um, low religious freedom or a lot of religious restrictions also tend to have higher level of country and political risks which I think also relates to the previous panel that we had on, on terrorism. And those countries that have high political and country risks also tend to have uh, less prosperity and less investment and less trade. So this is a, you know, the third uh, pathway, if you will. And I want to mention the fourth, and perhaps I think the most powerful. And that is what we know from economics is that religious freedom promotes uh, religious plurality or diversity. And it also promotes religiosity, interestingly enough. And one of the things that we know about diversity in economics is that diversity uh, helps nurture creativity and entrepreneurship. And more importantly, that when you have a diverse country that, that welcomes people of diverse backgrounds, including religious backgrounds, uh, it tends to attract more talent. So I think it's these four factors that tend to support or give support to religious freedom and its role in economic development. Thank you. Uh, economic development is driven by new ideas and risk taking. So anything that reduces the production of ideas, inhibits the sharing of ideas, prevents people from executing ideas by taking new ideas, by taking risks, will harm or may harm uh, economic uh, development. Restrictions on religion or uh, reductions of religious uh, uh, freedom can harm economic development by reducing the spaces in which uh, people can develop new ideas. It can do so by reducing experimentation, 
by reducing communication among certain groups of uh, uh, people, by uh, impoverishing public discourse and therefore the entry of new ideas uh, uh, into people's decision making. It can uh, uh, harm economic development also by ruling out certain ideas simply because of their association with uh, religion or simply because they were first expressed by people who happen to be uh, devout. Now, uh, a good example of uh, this comes from uh, uh, Turkey, where from the 1920s to roughly the early 1990s, uh, a series of uh, governments, uh, secular governments, tried explicitly to reduce the role of Islam in public life. Now, they had their reasons for doing so. Islam was associated with certain social problems uh, in the, uh, that became very acute in the 19th century and early 20th century. But whatever, their, whatever the rationale for doing this, it did have one important cost. It essentially reduced the entrepreneurship, inhibited entrepreneurship on the part of socially conservative and devout uh, uh, people. Uh, when this started to change in the 1990s, and especially after 2002 with the election of, uh, of an Islamist uh, uh, government uh, or a government formed by uh, uh, people with Islamist uh, origins, entrepreneurship received a massive uh, boost. Turkey has done very well economically in the last 20 uh, years or so. During this time, its uh, exports have risen by a factor of eight. Uh, it has become uh, one of the top six destinations for, for tourists. And if you look at who is doing the exporting and what parts of the country are, uh, are exports coming from, who is forming the new very successful hotel chains and tourism companies and so on, you see that uh, the uh, people from conservative towns who had for, for many decades been prevented from, uh, from uh, taking part in, in business, from receiving government contracts and so on, they have, played, uh, they have been playing an important uh, role. Now, I don't want to uh, uh, imply that uh, the uh, restrictions on, uh, on religion uh, or attacks on uh, religious freedoms come only from secularists. Religious leaders and their followers can themselves, and sometimes do themselves, uh, restrict religious uh, freedoms. They do this by uh, narrowing the definition of, uh, uh, of uh, who uh, uh, is practicing religion acceptably, what religions are, uh, or what interpretations of even their own religion are acceptable. In the, in the process, they impoverish uh, discourse and they limit their own intellectual capacity. I want to offer Pakistan since the 1940s as, uh, as a very sad example. In stages, Pakistan has, uh, uh, or the vast majority of Pakistanis has, have narrowed the definition of uh, a good uh, Muslim. They have uh, uh, stigmatized uh, people who uh, uh, hold uh, differing opinions of, uh, uh, of Islam. They have declared as heretics certain uh, groups of Muslims, for example, the Ahmadis. They've denied, effectively denied non-Muslims, such as the uh, Christians in, in Pakistan, the Hindus in, in Pakistan, the uh, right to participate in public uh, discourse to express, uh, uh, to express uh, their uh, opinions on political matters or social uh, matters. Now, of course, they have, through these restrictions, the uh, uh, Pakistan's religious leaders and their, their followers uh, who have, uh, who have uh, uh, participated in the uh, st stigmatization, for example, of uh, nonconformists, they have hurt the targeted groups, but they have also, and this is what I want to emphasize here, they have also hurt themselves greatly. 
They have uh, dramatically reduced Pakistan's intellectual capacity to solve its own problems. They have reduced the ability of Pakistan's universities to provide ideas that they can provide to the, uh, to the politicians in Islamabad to solve uh, problems. People are afraid of expressing certain ideas because they feel that they'll be uh, accused of blasphemy or they will be uh, accused of stepping outside the realm of acceptable definitions of, uh, of Islam. Uh, I have a, a friend who's, who's a Pakistani, a distinguished academic in the United States, who once said to me uh, in a very sad tone of voice, uh, I can either think or live in my own country in Pakistan. I can't do both. If I, if I want to be a thinking academic, I have to be in the United States. I can't do this in Pakistan. It's a huge loss to Pakistan, that he and this friend happens to be a devout uh, 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 Muslim. Now, I, I want to uh, qualify by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the point, my general point, that religious freedom is helpful to economic uh, development, that it promotes economic development. Expanding religious freedom does not automatically promote economic development. It depends partly on what ideas are unleashed through the expansion of religious uh, freedoms. As uh, uh, devout Muslims and uh, uh, Islamists in general in the Arab world and in the re rest of the Middle East, in the course of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, down to the present, achieved greater freedoms to express their, uh, their viewpoints, uh, to contribute to public discourse, they have uh, filled public discourse with certain economic ideas that are actually quite harmful to economic development. Just to give uh, a recent example from Mohamed Morsi's uh, uh, short uh, uh, tenure as uh, president of uh, Egypt, uh, on several occasions, he uh, brought up the, uh, uh, his, his wish that the uh, financial system in Egypt would gradually be uh, made to conform to the Sharia. Now, uh, this started scaring away capital, and, uh, uh, and had he implemented, he had time to implement some of his uh, plans, uh, this uh, uh, would certainly have uh, uh, damaged the Egyptian, uh, uh, Egyptian uh, economy. Now, I want to make one more uh, point, if I, if I still have uh, uh, some time. I, I want to make one more point that I think will uh, reinforce uh, uh, a point that Ilan made toward uh, the, uh, uh, the end. Uh, religious freedom... Uh, assists economic development partly by boosting people's commitment to other types of uh, uh, freedom. It strengthens, religious freedom strengthens people's commitment to artistic freedoms, intellectual freedoms, social freedoms, political freedoms, and so on. There are uh, a number of uh, uh, laboratory experiments that show that when people play uh, two different games in which they are free to pursue different strategies, for example, a public goods game and a competitive auction game. In the public goods game, they play more selfishly than they would if they were just pay playing a series of public goods games. In other words, the strategies they use in one context spill over into the, uh, the other context. This is a very basic reason, I think, w why we find in, as, as you point out and as your, your, your work is uh, pointing out, that indices of freedom are correlated. Countries where religious freedom is high 
uh, also the countries where economic freedom is high, political freedom is high, and, and so on. And so, and by the way, the, uh, these other types of freedom also reinforce uh, uh, religious uh, freedoms. Let me finally uh, say that if we look at the history of countries that uh, have uh, score low on religious freedom index uh, today, we will find many examples of how they have benefited themselves when at times of, in their history or in contexts where they have expanded religious uh, freedoms, where they've been tolerant of other people's uh, uh, freedoms, and that they have hurt themselves when they have restricted uh, religious freedoms. And I want to give you, just leave you with one example, because I think it's, it's a very important example whose consequences we are still living with today. Again, it involves the Middle East. Under Islamic law, under the Sharia, to be a Muslim is to live under Islamic law. Until the 19th century, it meant that in commerce, in finance, you followed Islamic law. Again, under the Sharia, if you're not a Muslim and you are from a protected, you, are, you belong to a protected minority faith, in the Middle East this, this meant being a Christian or a Jew, you had choice of law. You could do business under Islamic law and take, if you had disputes, you could take the cases to Islamic court or you could do business under any legal system of your choice, including Jewish law or Greek Orthodox law, and you could have disputes adjudicated by, uh, uh, by uh, synagogues and, uh, uh, and churches. Now, this didn't, this, the fact that Muslims or Islam had denied Muslims a freedom that it was extending to Jews and Christians did not become a handicap for Muslims until the 18th century. In the 18th century, it turned into a huge handicap. Christians and, and Jews were allowed to do business under the choice of law that they had, do business under Western legal systems. Muslims could not do this because they had to live as, uh, as Muslims. They could only do this, and, and in the end, this is how it happened, through collective action that, uh, that uh, brought secular courts to, uh, uh, to the region. So I'll stop there and start to go on. With, okay, with thank you much to follow up. Yeah. Okay, great idea. It has to be said, one wonders who came out of the massive banking crisis that almost destroyed the world economic system best, Sharia compliant banking or our banking. <laughs> That's a moot point, but I just might make it. We have, um, some, you probably know all of us had three questions, which were sent, I think it was a brilliant idea, three questions to answer, and we sent in actually some written responses to them. And I, it reminded me of my, my, my students being told by me, read the exam questions carefully and think what the examiner is looking for. And I realized, to my horror, the examiner was looking for causal pathways. And my second thought was, uh, Max Weber, come back, all is forgiven. Mm -hmm. And let's try and think about elective affinity and things like that. But thank heavens, the two former speakers have, I think, brilliantly given us um, some really coherent pathways, even if the word correlated with has crept in, rather as sort of undermining the causality quite a bit. But I'm, I'm very relieved, because I must admit, I found it very difficult to get something that I would really think of as sort of legitimate causes and consequences that weren't very diffused. And, and, and of course, nothing is ever monocausal. I think we take that for granted. What, what I really wanted to say is sort of a few marginal, sometimes almost tangential points to what's been said, I mean, we've dealt with economic development very much as in, in, in the sense of sort of growth in, in GDP. And yes, of course, if you look at Northern Ireland uh, at a time when there was considerable discrimination against Catholics, which lent to civil conflict, they're not on really on the basis of religion, clearly on the basis of, of different nationalisms where religious identity was 
probably much more significant on the Protestant side than the Catholic side. You saw a significant decline in the economic uh, success of the country. After the, the settlement in, in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, precisely the point that's been made, investment came in. So now Northern Ireland has got um, an unemployment rate of 4.2% versus the rest of the United Kingdom, which is more like 5.2%. I mean, that sort, of, that sort of thing, I think you could probably find similar examples around. Clearly, if, 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 if Morsi is frightening everybody by authoritarianism, uh, 1.2 million British tourism, tourists are not going to go to Egypt. And if tourism is 10% of the economy, we're going to see a pretty rapid consequence of government behavior. Whether that's got anything to do with Islam or, or fears about conflict and civil disorder and so on, and again, not necessarily easy to, easy to see. My own experience of living, well, living, working with in religious dialogue has been with Iran, which has been already cited as a country which has been notable for various levels of discrimination and, and low levels of, of religious freedom under the Veliat al-Fakhi, the, the rule of the jurists. And I think there you have some very, very interesting and, and quite fascinating non-sequiturs. You have very high level of women's education, but a very low level of women assuming important roles in development. And I mean, one of the sort of normal um, conventional wisdom of anybody involved in international development of the sort of Amartya Sen type, the building of capabilities, the empowerment of people, rather than the sort of the big macroeconomic economic story, is of course that women lead development. And I would certainly endorse the point that was made that a repressive atmosphere, a repressive regime, lack of religious freedom, stops the growth of creative ideas on how to do development and, to, and pushing forward, and particularly if, if there is a, a, a marginalization of women from positions of authority, that becomes much more, much more severe. International development agencies bring into countries new ideas. I mean, you think of the importance of Paolo Freire in development about, um, in thinking about development and the way his thoughts, the pedagogy of oppressed and so on, swept from the northeast of Brazil right the way through the international development uh, world and the significance of that. You think the way Amartya Sen's thinking has become absolutely very powerful and important in, in much the same way as, as, as Freire was. Well, of course, if you can't, if you have no books translated into Farsi, virtually, you know, after about 1975, sort of if you've got a climate in which this is Western thought coming in and contrary to Islamic thought, you're not likely to have that encounter and, and ferment of ideas. And, I, and the point's already been made. I don't need to make it, make it any more. Um, if I could just stray a little bit into the last question, which was all about the links of causality between violent religious... Ex I'm not messing up your position, am I, uh, Will? You're not going to sign. Okay. If I could stray into that. Um, one of the things that's coming out of the CVE, the Countering Violent Extremism World, and this is very fascinating for an organisation like mine, like the one I work in, the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, is the realisation of two things. One, that this is a struggle against... Um, a force that will be around for many years. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. The importance of youth, the importance of long-term strategies, the importance of education and creating a, and critical thinking and so on. And the, the, the second thing coming out of that is that the usual argument about is this uh, a religious problem, is this really a socioeconomic political problem, the sacralization of conflicts, the religionization of conflicts, so that problems that are basically socioeconomic, political, uh, are presenting as and becoming transformed into something in which people run around burning down churches or burning down mosques, 
is, is really, I think, a very important question to think about. And we've had this very futile debate. It's all about poverty. No, it's all about religious ideologies. It's a silly debate because I think now the CVE community are very, very aware of the fact that if young people do not have hope and opportunity, and hope and opportunity are the byproducts of a successful economic order. If they don't have hope, hope and opportunity, they do have a vulnerability to binary oppositions, takfiri thinking in the case of Islam, uh, burning Qurans in the case of, and so on. This, this, I think, is a very important insight that we mustn't and shouldn't, as it were, take apart religious ideology from the practical expression of religion. So if you have religions that are not engaged in health and education and in key preconditions for econ economic development, then you are creating circumstances in which the, the divided world of them and us, the divided world of the Muslims and the, and the Kafiri, that world will be very, very attractive to young people who have no hope and, and, and no opportunity. And in that sense, I think it's very, very important that even under the, the, the very, very important reality of the First Amendment and its provisions, that we find ways to support, as governments in, in Europe and in, in and the United States, Canada, we find ways to support governments and also to support religious communities that in places like Africa are, in many cases, doing on average about 40% of the health work in the country and sometimes equal, equal levels of the education work in the country. That insight has made some progress over the last decade. But on the, on the whole, the vast majority of development aid going into into, develop, into the developing worlds is going to governments, and only a tiny percentage of it is going to religious communities. If the local hospital is run by a Muslim community or by a Catholic community or Christian community, and it is better quality health care with better resources, more dedicated staff than the government hospital down the road, what are we doing? Where probably people have got two jobs, nobody on seat, uh, no drugs, badly managed and inefficiently managed. What are we doing putting money into ministries of health and ignoring it, which we must do to try and improve that, and not putting it into rationalizing the relationship of, between government and parallel health systems run and so on, so that um, the effectiveness of the religious sector in, in these countries is rewarded and able to, able to expand. I wish that the, the, this role was more possible, for example, in the United States, the development of faith community units in state structures in USAID, uh, the role of small, small bodies in, in the World Bank and so on and so on, are nearly always a very sort of marginal with the huge structure of the organization uh, and many of the decisions being taken at the level of middle management, as it were, within them. Whereas the little faith unit might very well be d uh, relating to the director of the organization. Just like gender in development, we need to think about mainstreaming religion into development practice. I mean, heaven above knows, 85% of the world has some kind of religious conviction or some kind of religious practice. And if you ignore that, you're either going to do no effective um, development work or you're, you're going to mess up good development work by underestimating the differences in worldviews and practices of, of different faith communities. Where have we got to? Well, I think I'm quoting, actually, somebody from Salt Lake City, one of, one of my colleagues in, in the conference we've just come from on religious development, um, on religious freedom, um, after, di after a lunch. And he, he said to me, you know, we've moved from denial to lip service. And I think that's where we are. And we need to move from lip service to serious governmental engagement with 
faith communities, not to support religion, not to favour one religion against another, but on the purely practical grounds that if the faith communities are doing a good job, they need the financial resources to do it better and to expand. Thank you, Will. Um, I think uh, Ian has been, the way you set it up was perfect because you've just provided a fantastic context for what uh, I'm about to talk about. Um, and of course, Professors Alan and uh, Quran painted a very important macroeconomic picture of the importance of religion for economic development. And I would like to tell you a little bit about my work, which is very micro. I mean, it is uh, at a micro level interviewing uh, micro entrepreneurs from various faith backgrounds and to see what the impact of religion is on their economic outcomes. And uh, you may think, you know, you know, what has this got to do with religious freedom? But hopefully by the end of not just the 10 minutes, or perhaps 12 or 14 will, but by the end of today, you'll realize that for the very poor, especially for the very poor women, religious faith has a very important link with economic uh, outcomes. So uh, I'm gonna start as I, by putting a, a, a name to, to, to the importance of religious freedom in the context that I work on in, which is in the, in the very violent slums, and I do research on this. I'm an economist who researches religious faith and economic outcomes of micro-entrepreneurs in Bangalore. In 2009, I interviewed a woman named Antaz, and she had just taken a loan of 5,000 rupees, which had uh, not at today's exchange rate, which is terrible, but in that ex exchange rate four years ago uh, was about, I'm going to say, $100. She took it to start a petty shop. I went to see her a uh, few months ago. Not only has she got the shop, but she has a washing machine, a refrigerator. She owns her home. Her two children are in college, and she's saving up for a laptop. She's not educated, she cannot read or write, but she's saving up for a laptop. Now, I'm not here to promote microfinance. I think it has a lot of problems. I am perhaps uh, a, one of the most vocal critiques of microfinance. It's, I find it very difficult when, ad, when it's advocated as a means to poverty alleviation because it's very hard to scale up. People put in vast amounts of money, and as you know from uh, you know, economics, you need a vast, large injection of funds for there to be any significant improvement in production. So I'm not here to promote microfinance. But what I'm here to show, say that <coughs> Antas, the experience of Antas and of many other women, and Antas, I would like to say, is a convert, a convert from Hinduism, then to Roman Catholicism. It's probably not good to say that in Georgetown now to Pentecostal Christianity. And there's a vast growing number of these women in the slum, and indeed in many areas of India, uh, of converts from Hinduism to Roman Catholic, uh, to Pentecostalism. And the uh, Antas is an example where we see an improvement in her economic, in the economic prosperity of these women as not associated with, say, a change in income, an increase in income. Her income has stayed stable. In fact, in some of the women, we've seen actually a, a decrease in income, but rather it's a result of a change in behavior. What is that change of behavior? I mean, the durable asset uh, accumulation has been quite significant. These people make 7,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees a month, but they've increased their asset base. Many of them have been able to lease homes and uh, send their children to fairly expensive universities. And uh, just to go back, we know that, you know, from our understanding of uh, investment in the future and what it takes to invest in the future, psychologists have worked on this, Robert Stoltz has done work on intertemporal utility maximization and, and so forth. The poor, poverty, I mean, Goulet said this, leads to 
uh, underdeveloped needs leads to poverty, powerlessness, and hopelessness. And the poor, for the poor, poverty is so depressing that it's actually debilitating. And many people say that the poor lack self-control. Perhaps it's because they're poor that they lack self-control. They have, I mean, in that, in that famous song, I mean, if we ain't got nothing, you ain't got nothing to lose. So they are utterly debilitated. But what happens with women like Antas and these others that I work with and I have researched is that they are plugged into very vibrant faith communities. These are storefront, literally storefront Pentecostal churches that um, meet once, uh, once a week for Sunday, but they also do meet during the week. The people are in and out of the homes of these women, the, the huts, and it could be one possible an explanation I say to you for the improvement in economic prosperity of which there is significant data, uh, as you, you will probably realize, not just from our report, which we hope to publish soon, but also from statistics from the Indian, um, some of the Indian uh, data we have on our uh, national data portal, is that perhaps these women are launched into what I may call a virtuous circle. They are the transfer of income, now it is important that they have got a transfer of income through the micro loan, in addition to a practice of tithing, which is very important for these women, they are committed to tithing. Now you may have problems in, uh, with, the, with some of the prosperity gospel that may be espoused by some of these churches, but they have committed. The word in Tamil is kanike, which is a vow. They have vowed to, to, to tithe a certain amount of money to the church, and they literally see the church grow. I mean, they build the church brick by brick. From a one room, they build a hall. So they're connected with the church community, a faith community, and they perhaps they feel better about themselves. They feel less hopeless. They certainly work longer hours. Many of them work as domestic servants, but also run small businesses, so they're working longer. They're feeling more hopeful, and suddenly the objectives that they have to perhaps educate their daughters, uh, buy that refrigerator, uh, are within reach. So in a sense, you know, I mean, hope is a wonderful incentive. Another outcome that I see from the uh, converts, and I'll get into what later to show you this area that, is, that, we, that I study is actually under severe persecution, uh, is domestic violence. One of the three things that can bring a family to its knees in a slum is medical shocks. I mean, getting a, a, a medical bill of, say, 100,000 rupees a lakh when they earn 10,000. One is domestic violence. The other is domestic violence. And third is alcoholism. The la last two are related. Our study shows that um, the converts to Christianity, as Antas was, this woman that I started off with, who was a victim of domestic violence for 15 years in the most violent way, are able to draw support, not just financial support, but emotional support from the faith community. And it literally opens the doors to their problems. They are less alienated. 40% um, of the women who expressed, uh, the, who, who said that they had experienced physical or sexual violence in our study, who were, 40% uh, of the women who all, of all the women who had expressed, who had experienced physical or sexual violence, 40% of them were Christian, uh, who had sought help, 40% were Christian. I'm getting confused, so I'm saying, of all the women who had been abused, only the, the largest number of women who had sought help were Christians. That is 40%. It's still low, but it's still. There are hardly any, I'm going to say 10% of our Muslim women and 15% of our Hindu women who had been abused actually sought help from someone. Another thing that these women had access to was male pastors. When their husbands were beating them up or breaking their teeth in, their male pastors were able to come into the home and talk with their very violent husbands. Again, the national, this, my data is, is corroborated with the National Family Health Service data that said that 32% of uh, Christian women who were abused seek help, whereas only 22% of Muslim women and 23% of Hindu women seek help. The persecution of Christians, 
These women are converts. The women I talk about here are converts. I do interview and study Muslims and Hindus, and I'll get and and. Um, but what I'm what we have experiencing in this area of Bangalore is an increase in persecution of these churches. These women are very outwardly uh, expressive about their faith. Uh, they have fasting and prayer meetings that sometimes are quite loud. And 25 minutes away from this slum, a pastor was recently beaten up a few, few days ago. And uh, there are threats to these, uh, to these women all the time. What, what, so, the, so the fact that these women are a, have the freedom at this point in time in the state of Karnataka, in this area, to practice religious faith and are able to convert has had had in our study over the last four years and then quite an impressive increase in their prosperity levels, not, not just asset accumulation, which is important to have a fridge or a washing machine, but for future investment, they're able to educate their children in English medium schools, which makes a big difference if you're in a Bang city like Bangalore, where you, you have to spend 30,000 rupees to send your child to college so that she or he, 10 years down the road, can get a job in IBM or Microsoft and perhaps lift the whole family out of generations of poverty. I don't know if I have time, Will. I probably don't, but I do have information on, on Muslims. Mm -hmm. Mus 90 seconds or so. 90 seconds. Content. Okay, well, yeah. we do study Muslim okay. clients, and, and you know, they face two problems in India. One is that they are, there's repression from the mainstream. I mean, uh, the Sarkar report, which I was talking to you about, uh, Professor Quran said that you know most Indian men, bearded men, walk uh, are often uh, regarded as ISI agents. Uh, so they they there's a lot they they're regarded as anti-national, as traitors, and but there's also repression of uh, self-imposed restrictions of the Muslims in our as we study them in our in India. But uh, one example is one of the questions we asked our women is so what kind of activity do you, or what where, or, 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 or place do you go to, or what kind of help do you seek from your religion in the time of crisis? Our Pentecostal women said they bring the pastor home or they conduct a prayer meeting. The Muslim women, who are mainly South Asian Tamil Muslim women, they speak Tamil and Kannada, they're not really comfortable in Urdu, so they're, they've got a strong history in the area. They're old, uh, old, old, many generations they've been Muslims from the time of Emperor Tipu Sultan, they said they visit the Darga. The Darga is a shrine, and uh, it's one particular Darga they visit. It's called the Dazrat of Hazrati Mastani Ma. She was apparently a vegetable seller, and uh, she had a, there was a miracle. But women go to her, and you could see throngs of Muslim women from the slum, Dalit Muslim women, outcast Muslim women, praying at the shrine. This is the one place where they can actually pray together, and this is the one shrine they can play right near the tomb. It is a marvelous thing to witness. But there is, we have noticed from the time we started our study to recently when we conducted our final tranche of data collection last year, that there has been strict imposition, not just from the clerics, but from social pressure for these women to stop attending, visiting the shrine. And uh, that seems to me you know, a problem because it's further segregating them, it's isolating them. And, you know, if a per, as Lowry said, you know, this wonderful economist said, he, he's done amazing work on segregation in, in the African American community, and he says, you know, identity is formed in, society, in, 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 in community. And it seems to me that the, because of Hindu nationalism and also because of these self-imposed restrictions, the Muslim community, certainly in our area, are becoming more and more isolated and segregated. And they, uh, two things are happening. One is they are less likely to want to make a difference in their lives. They're less likely to want to improve their lives. And secondly, they're indulging in practices and activities that are destructive, socially destructive, and is reinforcing the view from the outside that, yeah, this is who these people are. So. Well, a uh, tremendous and fascinating range of perspectives uh, here, both uh, geographically and then at different different levels levels of analysis. But I guess if I can put the first question to the panelists, I noticed that 
None of you really took fundamental exception to the basic premise of the, the question of the panel, which is that there is, all of you talked in different ways about what there being some sort of connection and even a causal pathway between religious liberty and, and economic growth. So I have a two part, and there, there were some qualifications, some saying it's necessary but not sufficient, so I don't want to overstate it, but still no, no exception to the fundamental premise. So two questions, one, uh, why are we just now in the year 2013 having this panel? If there, if there is, we've had religion for a long time, we've had religious liberty for a long time, we've had economic growth for a long time. Why has this been ignored for by generations of, of scholars? And then the second, if I can be maybe play the, the skeptic here. Um, so if I if there is this connection, then you know I look at the world. I think of a couple of the most impoverished countries in the world: Haiti and Burundi. Yeah. High levels of religiosity, pretty good levels of religious freedom. They're not known as, you know, they're not the North Koreas of the world for high levels of religious persecution, but desperately poor. Then I look at the biggest economic success story of the last three decades, China, which is also one of the worst religious persecutors out there. Uh, so help me understand this. Are we overstating this too much, um, the connection between religious liberty and economic growth? So I, uh, I may want to say a couple of things about uh, your question. I think the first the Feel first, it's a totally unfair question, but the, hey, you know. <laughs> the first part is that I think that this panel, as well as uh, previous <laughs> panels, have obfuscated the different variables that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So we talked about religiosity or religion or religious type, and that's really not religious freedom, mm -hmm. okay? That's a cultural variable. We talked about religious freedom and political repression as part of it, and what it is the core of religious freedom is the institutions. Right? And what I think is at the core of this institution is the tolerance for the cultural other. So during the various panels, we talked about uh, race, we talked about gender issues, we talked about uh, sexual preference and nationalities being part of it. And the third one is uh, religious pluralism, majority, or minority, which are demographic, belongs to the demographic environment. So I think we have been talking about religious freedom across these three levels. Now, having said that, um, one of the points that Timur made earlier is that uh, religious freedom uh, can lead to Sharia law, which could have disastrous impact. I, I think the Sharia law is, in the case of Egypt, as the example uh, that Timur has given, is the, in fact a type of uh, religious uh, imposition on, on, on the rest of the country that must follow a particular law. Having said that, I think that, uh, to answer your question maybe more directly, is that the, it's not, a, it's not a, just a linear, uh, straightforward type of relationship. That is to say that religious freedom could actually lead to um, country risk, could actually lead to warring factions, because now they can express themselves. As before, we've seen that in the case of Yugoslavia, we've seen that in the case of Egypt, now that we can all express ourselves as freely as we want. We can now start killing each other also. Um, so I think what we have to think about is what moderating variables affect it all. So I think, first of all, the type of religion. Max Weber talked about the Protestant ethic. China, we could talk about Confucianism and its impact on, on economic development. I think, that, I think that's important. Um, I think to what extent different religions are represented in the society is also important. And finally, looking more specifically about religious freedom, I think religious freedom is most effective when you have a rule of law. So when you have a way to communicate with one another civilly and under law, we're able to express ourselves and even if we have differences, still be friends and conduct business together. So the uh, Weber, Max Weber just, uh, just came up. That signifies that there has been an interest in comparative religion. Uh, and of course, there are many others, uh, many of them not as famous as Max Weber, who have written, who have compared religions, who have, who have identified connections between religion and economic uh, uh, development. But if you look at the uh, the work done before the, say, the 1970s, uh, including Max Weber's work, it tends to look at 
the identify certain key institutions of various variables. Protestantism has a certain ethic that is lacking in other religions or other, other uh, types of Christianity. Islam is lacking the, uh, the, the corporation and that uh, distinguishes it from, uh, from other uh, uh, religions. It, uh, other writers talked about uh, Islam being more hostile to the commerce which of course would not have been true in the Middle Ages uh, at all. But anyway, they identified certain characteristics and then took those characteristics as fixed. Now, and then for a long time, from 1970 to the mid-1990s, nobody really addressed this issue as economics and also the other social sciences became, became increasingly quantitative. One of the reasons they shunned the study of religion or the study of links between religion and economic development, they didn't see ways of quantifying it. Now, what has is, what is changed now, we have a, a new wave of research that is, uh, that is taking place. What has changed is, first of all, we have the new institutional economics that has given us ways of studying institutions and testing some of the, the predictions of uh, testing various predictions, uh, comparing institutions in ways that Weber and others in past generations uh, uh, could not do. But secondly, and more important, we now have ways to study institutional change and explore when institutions don't change, dysfunctional institutions don't change, why they don't change. And uh, this is due to work done outside of uh, this area. The theory of collective action, for example, that was uh, initiated by Mansur Olson and others was, uh, uh, was not motivated by an interest in understanding the role of religion, but it has proved very, very valuable in this, in this field. So now there is an interest in, in the dynamics of religion, and that's where freedom comes in very naturally because one, one uh, aspect of dynamics is the, is the freedom to, to change. The freedom to change the way you're interpreting your religion, the way you, to change the, your interpretation of the text, to, uh, uh, to uh, add to the religion, add new institutions, uh, borrow from, from other, other religions. And of course, freedom comes in, uh, comes in naturally. So, so that is why I think it's, uh, we're at a point in intellectual history where it's very, when, when it's very natural to bring, bring, bring up this uh, question. And if I can just uh, your, uh, touch on your, your second question, uh, uh, Haiti, I think uh, uh, it, it's a very well chosen example, Haiti versus uh, uh, China with uh, very different records. Religious freedom is not the only thing that, uh, that matters. They're, they're in a complex system, lots of things uh, that matter. And also, the, with regard to China, China has started to develop from a very uh, low base. We, the, we still don't know how far it's going to be able to go, whether it's going to uh, succeed in uh, in having a smooth transition to a freer political system. One miracle was its smooth economic transition out of communism to a, a more market-friendly uh, system. We don't know whether it's, whether it's going to be able to uh, uh, have a second miracle. Mm -hmm. and, and China, if I just may add, is really not a liberal economy, right? Yeah. It's not a liberal economic system. Mm -hmm. At best, it could be described as state capitalism, mm -hmm. which is directed capitalism. I, I sort yeah. of share your skepticism, actually, mm -hmm. Will, on, at, at, in almost the same way as, as you do. But my actual experience of, of, of just going and talking to people in the World Bank and talking to people in state institutions is that you know? I go and I want to talk about the Tony Blair Faith Foundation 
interfaith program in Sierra Leone, which is reaching 1.5 million people, uh, you know, declining malaria with religious leaders combating malaria because they've just got that level of authority, they have the Heineken effect, they can get to people that nobody else can get to, and so on and so on and so on. For the first 25 minutes, and usually I've only got a half an hour, uh, I'm talking about the crimes of the faith communities, about, you know, wrong views on abortion, contraception, but above all, proselytism, and very, very interesting, uh, and almost uh, very, very, I find almost a strange perception that the reason that faith communities do what you and I would call development work as part of their, um, of, of their work, and, and the reason that their doing development work is precisely part of the meaning of the practice and expression of religion as part of a, a religious freedom right, which incidentally is very interesting in Iran. The, the little Catholic community there is allowed to look after the lepers but it's very controlled, that's it. They're not allowed to sort of, as it were, do um, gender awareness for, for Ayatollahs, as, as you might well imagine. Um, the point is, it seems to me, that um, the vast majority of faith communities do not use development instrumentally. On the other hand, it has to be said that that does not mean that when they are doing work in their hospitals, when they have that the Catholic school system throughout the world, for example, uh, the LDS work in humanitarian relief, does not mean, even though there is a very conscious and firm division between anything to do with missionary activity and anything to do with humanitarian aid in all of these, it does not mean that there isn't some kind of hope and desire for people to adopt what for them would be obviously a paradigmatic position that you know, their faith is the best faith and, and pe pe people should join it. So if you look at, for example, Hezbollah or even Sinn Féin in, 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 in the north of Ireland, you see the most extraordinarily effective proliferation of social services, which builds up the respect of the people for the organization. Now, Obviously, this, there, are, there are a number of different purposes to that in, in those, those sort of circumstances. But the idea that, I suppose we've got to call it and say, look, this is actually about soft power. Everybody does soft power. And my definition of soft power is getting other people to do, other people to want what you want without coercing them. Now. I, d I cannot see all that much wrong with that. But if you, if you put this sort of fearful branding on it, proselytism, therefore we can have nothing to do with it, it does seem to me to be totally prescinding from what is the reality on the ground. And that's not a very good basis for policy. Well, I just want to say that I was, uh, when I worked at the World Bank, um, when, we were, when President Wolfenson was there, and they were setting up the faith and... World Faith Development World Dialogue. Dialogue, which of course uh, Berkeley Center uh, uh, faculty Catherine Marshall was, head, was part of, I think she was head of it for a while, uh, started it. Um, one of the things that came out during discussions was um, religion is patriarchal. It is controlled by men, it subjugates women, uh, so that's, you know, you can't have anything to do with it. And this was happening at a time when we at the bank were drawing on religious leaders to help us combat what would be the surge in HIV AIDS in Uganda at the time. They were coming to the bank, bank staff were going to Uganda, we were meeting in churches and helping them, asking them to help us combat and uh, this, what could have been a terrible public health issue, but religion is regarded as patriarchal. I mean, Martha Nussbaum writes this book, Women and Development, when she does, on her, when she, and she talks about women in India, and she talks about women in India who, she says, see uh, religion as oppressive because it kills their autonomy, it kills their uh, sense of independence, it destroys who they want to be. So there are these views out there about, these, about religion. On, on the other hand, in, in Latin America, the, I've 
heard the Pentecostal churches being described as domestication of the Latin American male. Okay, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> which is sort of, which <laughs> is certain, to certain extent true, because I mean, if, 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 you know, if you take a sort of Catholic, it becomes a Pentecostal. If the consequence of that yeah. is that they stop drinking a great deal, they actually turn up for work, and the wife doesn't get beaten in the evening, that's going to have profound economic consequences. Absolutely. <laughs> well, there are certainly within religion, there are oppressive practices. And one thing that I don't think we've done, those of us who advocate the importance of religion in development, is that we haven't brought oppressive practices, practices that oppress women, and theologically debatable uh, issues regarding the status of women, we haven't brought them to the fore and we haven't discussed them adequately. So that's probably what we haven't done. Another very interesting thing uh, is that many economists and Esther Duflo, who's probably going to win uh, the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize for Economics certainly within the next 10 years, has started talking a lot about hope. Many economists talk about self-control. Of course, they've talked about trust but they don't root it in anything religious. And when one does research with, certainly with, with the poor, and look at, uh, and, and, and when one does research on religion in contexts such as India, as that, which I know of, and South Sudan, where I work and do research on, hope is not an inchoate feeling that things are gonna do, gonna turn out fine. It's actually rooted in a belief in the transcendent that gives meaning to their activities in the present. So, uh, you know, we have both acted as one-eyed giants, in Goulet's words, the people in the religious field as well as in the development field because we've acted as though man can only live on perhaps, you know, manna from heaven or by bread alone. So I think there needs to be a discussion, and certainly in the gender field. There are books written on women and religion. It's about sexuality, prayer. There's a lot of work on the family, but not on women and development, that area. It's not. The Human Development Report in 2004 touched on themes, but I don't think there's been anything else lately that's really gone into this, so. If, if, I mean, and you'll know better than anybody, if it's true, say, that in, in India, the Catholic Church is doing some of the best work in HIV, AIDS, prevention, countering stigma, and so on, and you give the Catholic Church in India a big piece of money, and somebody says to you, but you're reinforcing a patriot patriarchal institution. I mean, one's forced to say, yes, you are, mm. but isn't the good that is coming out of that patriarchal institution and, and the need so great that you, know, you should do it? I, I, mean, I would say that the, the, the patri patriarchy argument is really quite a substantive argument, and it needs discussing mm -hmm. and balancing against the good that the, that the churches are doing. Well, just as man cannot live by bread alone, a good panel cannot live on the moderator's questions alone. So let's turn it over to the audience. I had to have some sort of segue. <laughs> Professor Durham has waited patiently in the front uh, row. Can we get a microphone here, please? Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, so Cole Durham from Brigham Young University. Uh, this is a question really asked to people with economic background uh, from a standpoint of non-economic background. But, uh, it's often seemed to me that there's a kind of two-step argument from religious freedom to religiosity, which I take it was one of the pathways. And then uh, one of the things that I didn't hear mentioned, and I just wonder what people think about this, uh, the extent to which religiosity may inculcate patterns of honesty that reduce transaction costs in an economic system that substantially free up uh, resources. Uh, yeah. Sure, you're not an economist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think you're you're absolutely right, and I think the uh, the issue of trust was also often uh, embedded in economic models on the basis of uh, of religion. But I think you're right, uh, and I think America is uh, is really an exception here. In a sense, uh, religious freedom has given rise to religious competition which in, in a sense has given rise to religiosity and belonging to a church. So it shows you, you know, this case in point shows you that in fact freedom can lead to more religiosity and has worked for America quite well. The American uh, economic system is the largest in the world and has an impact on other economies in the world, uh, which in turn, those economies who give religious freedoms have greater links to America and can benefit from uh, the American economic model. 
There is, in fact, quite a lot of uh, work that uh, connects religiosity with increasing uh, uh, trust and therefore reduction in transaction costs. One recent work uh, looked at uh, Pakistani Muslim pilgrims, people who went to Mecca, and the, the issue was whether they would, in fact, become more trustworthy and whether they would be trusted more. And it turns out that uh, the answer to both questions is yes. And they were, they were able to, since people, Pakistanis going on a pilgrimage are selected by a lottery, they had a control group. And so this was a very nicely uh, designed, uh, nicely designed uh, pa paper. And uh, it turns out that the mechanism is that people who uh, interact at, while conducting the pilgrimage with people from all around uh, the world uh, uh, just uh, develop, uh, uh, develop uh, bonds uh, with, with others, learn that uh, people who are, are very different from them culturally can have, uh, can be very, uh, can be very uh, generous. And uh, the feelings that they develop in the course of the, uh, and what they learn in the course of their pilgrimage actually has a long lasting uh, effect when they, uh, uh, when they go back. Now there is of course uh, one, a, a negative side to this as well in many contexts that uh, religiosity tends to uh, increase, strengthen bonds among people within the same congregation or the same religion or the same sect, at the same time, it reduces, uh, in, in the long run, it reduces uh, trust toward people outside. And one of the reasons that happens is because, uh, for the very reason that you trust people within the network, you interact with them more, and you're less accustomed to interacting yeah. with, where, with where others. That, where that hasn't yes. been the case is, interestingly enough, Senegal and the Muridia. I mean, the, the Muridia have got this vast, extensive, uh, they're, they're a tariqa, like the Tijani or the Qadariya, they're sort of brotherhood, a lodge type of thing, not unlike a Masonic lodge. And they are basically a business community which started out in Senegal in, I think, in about the f maybe 20s or 40s. But now, you know, you'll get Muridia businessmen right across Paris, Montreal, and so on. And Senegal has... I think not unjustifiably prided itself on, on, on leading at a governmental level in interfaith relations in, in West Africa. I would put Sierra Leone quite close to it in, uh, at, at a sort of low level. But there, I think the real amaze, a real case where you can see it almost happening is, is the Moridia. Well, an example that I have from uh, my work with micro-entrepreneurs and the way in which religiosity helps reduce uh, costs is that you don't know much about the population you're lending to at all in microfinance, which is why the loans are so high, the interest rates are so high. In South Sudan, the interest rate is a shocking 36%. And in India, sometimes it can be 22%, which is quite a lot of money, but you do not know about to whom you're lending because they don't have collateral, they don't have a, a credit history. But one thing that we noticed in our study is that Christian, Pentecostal Christians, uh, who were converts, that were converts, actually experienced, even with this informal money market, they experienced lower interest rates because there was a color, kind of an integrity issue. People knew these people did not drink. They had a fridge in their house. They owned the house or leased the house. They had a two-wheeler outdoor, outside. So if they were going to borrow, borrow as much as, say, 3, 300,000 rupees, three lakhs, they were going to pay it because in a sense, they were a better risk. So they were at lower interest rates. So this is something, that, again, that not many people have looked at because it's uh, uh, an issue that perhaps some place like the World Bank and others ought to look at with respect to interest rates. If I, if I may connect your question also to China. I recall now that I had a conversation with uh, two deans in Jiao Tong University in Shanghai. And they said to me that the problem of China is that it doesn't have a religion. And I was perplexed because I thought that, you know, anytime, you know, Huntington's thesis that anytime two religions come into contact with another, there's possibilities for clash. And I said, well, why is that? 
And they said it's because society lacks morality because of the lack of religion. And I said, but you have law, and the law says that you shouldn't cheat and steal and all these other things. Yes, they told me. But if you think you can get away with it, mm -hmm. there's no real accountability. So what religion gives us is the belief in accountability, mm -hmm. which perhaps gives us you know, a chance to be more trustworthy. Absolutely. And there's a very serious issue at the moment with the uh, the Muslim, well, not just, yes, m mainly Muslim system of remittances from migrant labor back to their families in places like Bangladesh. And because of the, the money laundering um, directives and the need to control um, uh, un flows of money to undesirable recipients, the Hawala system is being destroyed, putting at peril and, and creating quite a significant amount of poverty uh, because, you know, it's huge, I mean, so many countries, I mean, Haiti would be another example, is absolutely dependent on, on, on remittances. And it's, it's a very serious issue now, and it's quite difficult, difficult to disentangle. Another, another question. Another question so, uh, yes, they're in the back. So if a microphone can make its way back to you. There's one on its way, I think. Can't see a thing with the lights. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Jake Ansar, I'm with the Hindu American Foundation. My question is for uh, Ms. Rebe uh, Dr. Rebecca Shah, is it? Or Just Ms. call me Rebecca. Rebecca. And the gentleman sitting next to him, just next to her. Uh, That's me. The Hindu American Foundation has received reports from our contacts in India that uh, the uh, proselytization work that is connected with uh, developmental um, entities like hospitals and, and others they oftentimes feel obligated to convert. And there has been harassment of families who have received such aid as, as um, medical aid or such to convert. And if they don't convert, if they don't put a cross on the front of their home, then they are visited by missionary leaders and such. So is, uh, have you come across any such research? I've not come across such research, but a couple of days ago, uh, what's your name again? I'm Jay. Jay, uh, the New York Times published an article which showed that, in fact, vast numbers of converts who've converted about 10 or 15 years ago in India from Hinduism to Christianity were being forced to convert back. There are actually no benefits to converting in India because since the 1950s, we have a statute which for the very poor, for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, we, because they're not Indian, if, you're, if you convert to Christianity or if you're a Muslim in India, you're seen as caste-less. And because you're caste-less, without caste, you do not benefit from any uh, grants to build a house, educational grants, or recently grants to buy a house. It is not fun or in any way financially beneficial to become a Christian or indeed to be a Muslim. So no, I, I'm, I have not heard, but... Uh, as, as, and I probably should let Ian handle this because he gave an earlier an excellent utter or answer on the instrumental nature of, of, of the accusation uh, that is often leveled at uh, religious organizations. But, the, but um, and Bob Woodbury's work is very good on this because, you know, on, 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 on uh, the work of missionaries. But I haven't heard of any forced conversions by Christians uh, of Hindus but I'd be very grateful if you could let me know afterwards of any instances. Yes. The only thing I would, I would add to that is, I sort of prompted a little, yeah. is that, that if you take most of the faith's compassion, although systemically in a different part of the religious system in each different faith and not being totally comparable, Compassion is an important ingredient in it, so that, and you have it built in. I mean, the concept of, of zakat is, is obviously a, a concept of, and tithing to some extent, is, is, is a concept of compassionate, compassionate giving, so that, that that motivation, that charitable outreach, as it were, is central to the life of the faith. It's just as central as worship in, 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 in most in most faiths, sadaka and sedek for, for Jewish Fitra. communities mm -hmm. and so on. And, and you'd find comparable, very similar, Sewa Day. I mean, we've, I, my, I have an email now say, about Sewa Day on my, 
my Blackberry, and so on. They, and there's, I mean, the Karen Armstrong position that sort of all faiths are the same because they all believe in commission is obviously nonsense. But there is a degree of convergence so that, for example, in, in the United Kingdom, we have amazingly good Islamic development agencies like Islamic Relief, which to some extent have followed things like World Vision that's been mentioned. I mean, the, the, the model of the modern development agency that has a universalist outreach, it isn't just for members of your own community, has been struggled for within the Jewish community, within the Muslim community, and within the Christian community. Not necessarily at the same time, it's because the struggles come later in many cases within Islam, but something like Islamic Relief was started in reaction to the Ethiopian famine in, in, in 19, 1984 and comes straight out. And the idea is that zakat giving should go to Islamic relief that will be able to implement the, the, the consequences of the giving more effectively, whereas the spiritual effects on you as a zakat giver will be just the same. It's not instrumental. <laughs> Except okay. spiritually. Well, uh, mindful, you guys can take that up afterwards because we've got a couple Sorry. more questions I want to get in um, before the end. So, uh, yes, in the in the red back here, what we'll do is we're going to take two questions at once. We'll take your question, then we'll take this gentleman right here, uh, and then the panel will wrap them up. So, thanks. Um, mine is a wee bit more a comment than a question. Having worked in war and conflict zones for many, many years, I have found that it's not just freedom of religion we need to be concentrating on, it's freedom from religion as well. The problem for people like myself who come from an Afghan background but have worked in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and God knows where else, where religions happen to be at the root of a lot of problems. I tend to agree a great deal more with Rebecca, and so I'm very grateful you had one ethnic woman on that panel, because she can actually identify with a lot of what I seem to be working with. The problem for women like myself is, we're born in a very unequal world. Establishment societies are going to make a woman who wants to be part of any kind of establishment cringe and crawl until she gets there. Now, here's the thing. Religion is very good if it is kept personal, if it is practiced in the confines of one's home or mosque or temple or church. However, it has become destructive in the societies, at least that I'm working in. What we have to do is concentrate on community elders tribal leaders, community professionals, like lawyers, doctors, etc., etc., to help us develop those communities. And then they decide further how much power they wish to give to religious institutions and entities. Thank you. And then uh, this gentleman right here, the last one. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much again. I think my, I fully agree the contribution of uh, religious freedom to, to whatever economic development and other issues discussed. But I would like to put it also in context. What about you know, a system uh, that recognizes religious freedom also recognizes other freedoms that are relevant and important and in fact a prerequisite for economic development and others? So I'm wondering if we somehow isolate the issue of religious freedom by its own, it may not give us a full picture. So I'd like a reaction on that aspect. I mean, a, a system which is not democratic enough to accommodate other, other rights, other freedoms, still may have a problem, and I really appreciate in that regard the mention about the rule of law uh, while playing on that regard. The second one is, what is your... Um, inputs on tolerance and coexistence among the societies. You may have a religious freedom and on one or another hand, but you may not have history of or whatever culture of tolerance and coexistence. Even in you know, a rule of law may say there is a religious freedom, the constitution or whatever, but still you know, there, there may be a societal sort of interaction. And my last point is, uh, is peace is not a factor that play among all these regards. I mean, when we talk about religious freedom and other freedoms, ultimately the society is playing as an output, peace as a whole, which contributes to economic, social, political development. 
So if we don't play that into the picture, probably it may underestimate or overestimate what we are discussing. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Well, so we have uh, just a few small, uh, easy questions there. Relationship between religion and oppression and injustice, um, the relationship between religion and peace, the relationship between religion and freedom. A lesser panel would quail at this, but these four, uh, if you have about 45 seconds each, um, please uh, take this up and give us some magisterial responses. So, all right. Uh, so first of all, to the first comment, um, I believe that religious freedom includes also uh, freedom from religion. That's the whole point of religious freedom. So I think that that needs to be emphasized. Uh, uh, and to the second gentleman, I, uh, I agree with you 100%. That is to say that both Timur and I, I think, emphasize that economic prosperity, economic development is a function of many variables, mostly economic variables, by the way, including both political and social variables. So uh, in the paper that I, uh, that I wrote that I alluded to earlier, I actually uh, had to look at the impact of religious freedom above and beyond economic and political freedom. And uh, during the review process, uh, the reviewers have asked me to control for all the other factors that are typically associated with uh, economic development. And even after controlling for all these factors, uh, religious freedom uh, was a significant and positive variable in the economic prosperity, except for one variable and except for one country. And I guess I should say that. The one variable is civil freedom. So when we include civil freedom, instead of religious freedom, it sucks up all the variation of religious freedom. So religious freedom and civil freedom seem to be closely intertwined. Makes a lot of sense, actually, if you look at the variable and what it actually measures. And the one exception, the outlier in the whole thing is China. China doesn't fit the kind of the, the general theoretical speculations that we have about the topic. So that's my 45 seconds, I'll okay, stop great. here. Okay, to uh, uh, religious freedom incorporates uh, the freedom from religion, uh, as Elan said, and I've always used it in, in that uh, sense. Uh, religious freedom is broader, however, than tolerance and coexistence. Not only does it involve tolerating other religious uh, groups or non-religious uh, groups, uh, allowing them to coexist with you, uh, allowing them to participate in public discourse, allowing them to be elected to, uh, to public office and so on, it allows also everyone the freedom to choose among these different faith communities or choose to be, stay outside of all of them. And so in that sense, it's a broader, uh, uh, broader concept. We have uh, lots of examples historically of societies that have tolerated certain minorities but denied them many uh, uh, freedoms and denied the majority the right to become a part of the minority uh, community. So it's a, it's, I, I think we're all using freedom uh, of uh, religion uh, in, in, a, in a much broader sense than tolerance and coexistence. I, religious, religious freedom is at heart a right to meaning and the right to live in and express that meaning uh, within nation states because obviously claims of all freedoms are ultimately have to take place in the context of nation states. That's why the situation of refugees is so absolutely critical because if we believe in objective human rights, then the naked human being, this is Hannah Arendt, the naked human being, as it were, you know, at the, at the door of the gas chamber or on the boat going to Lampedusa, that naked human being has nothing other than their humanity and their human rights to, to protect them. And it's at that moment that the human rights are most gravely violated because they don't have a state. The Jews were, prior to the Holocaust, the Jews lost their citizenship. So we have a special responsibility in human rights to refugees. And I think if we actually look at the Middle East, if we look at Jordan and Turkey, both Islamic countries, and look at their hospitality and their extraordinary response to the Syrian refugees, we should be humbled in our attitude to the people who, the naked human beings, as it were, who we give quotas for and turn away from our shores because we wish to protect our political position 
against the extreme right. Um, the other thing, I'll just say, I, one of my Palestinian friends, I, I thought I was talking to him about, you know, why, why can't we have more of a campaign for religious freedom? And he said, Ian, if, it's not a question of religious freedom, it's a question of all the human rights. We, we don't have, under these dictatorships, any human rights. I mean, or they're all being violated in one, one way or another. And of course, that was exactly the origins of the Declaration, because a number after the Holocaust, after the terrible sort of repression under Stalin of religious communities, everybody was, was looking at the need for religious freedom. And Eleanor Roosevelt and the American government at that point said, you can't just have religious freedom. You've got to have other rights, else religious freedom is going to be meaningless. It, it doesn't work. You've got to have the full cluster. So I think that's important. The second thing on... I, I deeply, deeply, deeply um, understand the point being made of, from our colleague who uh, originated in Afghanistan. It seems to me, though, and this is a simple, naive, crude statement, sorry, there is bad religion and there is good religion. And I think it's in everybody's interest to get rid of the bad religion and work for the good religion. That's my boss, Tony, speaking, <laughs> not me, but I agree with him. Which one of the bad religions? <laughs> <laughs> well, what we've just heard, I mean, one would hardly describe life under Taliban ruled in Afghanistan as an example of the best qualities of religion. So it's not really religion, it's the application of religion that is bad. Mm. No, it's the ideas within, the ideas, the, the, the repressive ideas about women, the takfiri attitudes, the rejection of anybody who, even other Muslims who don't think like you, is beyond the pale and therefore worthy of death. That, you know, if you, if you don't toe the line, if you want to convert to, to another faith, you better get out of the country quickly, else you're likely to be killed. I mean, it's, it's not, I, this is hardly contentious to say this is bad religion. <laughs> Re Rebecca, the final I word. Just, just to say that everybody talks about uh, religious freedom, and recently there's been a lot of talk about religious freedom in India because we, our election is about to take place in, in March. And someone, want, someone recently wrote about uh, Amartya Sen's writing on Akbar. And Emperor Akbar was great with religious tolerance. So what was interesting was he was in very much in favor of religious tolerance. So he tolerated, as you very clearly explained, uh, Professor Quran, he tolerated in a unique way for the time, the Hindus in his court, and uh, he had uh, fantastic meetings where he discussed, but again, it was a toleration of these people, whether they were fully allowed to be participate and uh, have the kind of freedom or the religious freedom that we talk of as a foundational freedom, I'm not sure, and Sen uh, is also clear about that again. Emperor, another great emperor in India that was a very great about religious toleration was Emperor Ashoka, who was a Hindu convert to Buddhism. Again, it was toleration. But like the religious freedom that comes from a Judeo-Christian root, so which comes from I'm, the religious freedom that, that you have here in America, I don't think one could say that that's ha that was at the same time as Akbar or Ashoka. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert. But another panel maybe will. Okay, that's right. Okay. Well, please, uh, please join me in a round of applause to our very insightful panelists. So, thank you.